Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture which is all about animals. So first we'll do an introduction in general to animals and then we'll go over some details about protosomes versus deuterosomes. Now the first thing I want to point out when we talk about animals is well what actually makes an animal an animal. So there are four key traits that I want you to associate with being shared by all animals. Basically these four traits make something considered an animal. The first trait is something we've mentioned before, terminology you should already know, which is that all animals are multicellular eukaryotes. What, they, what that means is that each animal you encounter will have more than one cell and each of their cells will have a nucleus and internal membranes because they're eukaryotes as opposed to prokaryotes which we know are things such as bacteria and archaea. The second point we make about animals is that they are heterotrophs and heterotrophs as you know these are organisms that basically have to take in food okay it's that they have to take in organic substances to break them down to obtain carbon which they, they then use as their building blocks okay so for instance this animal here known as the tony or one of my brothers he is a heterotroph ingesting food okay so you may not always see it in that form as you know eating food the way we do but all animals have to take in organic material in order to obtain their carbon source which makes them heterotrophs as opposed to the autotrophs that we talked about which we consider autotrophs self-feeders that can break down inorganic material for carbon the third point is that all animals at some point or another in their life cycle are what we call motile okay they have motility which means they can move on their own okay and when i say at some point what i mean is that not every animal will always be capable of movement you know for instance the way you think of humans being able to to move around instead some animals are only able to move at certain stages in their life cycle such as as a larva okay so as long as it moves at some point throughout its life on its own it can you know meet that qualification for uh qualification number three the fourth and final key trait that we have on this slide for animals is that animals all animals except for sponges Okay, so underline, circle, star, highlight, sponges are the only animals not meeting this fourth qualification. All animals should have neurons and muscles, and that actually kind of helps with the third point that we already made, the movement point, because neurons are what's capable of sending electrical signals to other cells, and then muscles, they contract, and they're big players in the movement that we just talked about in the, the previous step. And, you know, neurons and muscles, you wouldn't be able to do anything that you do on a daily basis without both of those being part of your body. Okay, so when you think of animals, make sure you know that they share these four key traits and that trait number four, having neurons and muscles, the only animal that is exempt from that are sponges okay so again circle star highlight that point now speaking of sponges sponges are actually what we tend to consider to be the first animals now keep in mind this is the main hypothesis of what the first animals are so sometimes when you read about or google search about first animals sometimes it may use other terminology or look into other possible hypotheses, but the most widely accepted hypothesis to answer the question, what are considered to be the first animals? The answer I'm looking for is sponges. So circle star highlight that answer. Now, what evidence did they use to demonstrate sponges as the first animals? Well, there are three main forms of evidence. There is fossil evidence, 
morphological evidence and molecular evidence. And all three of these categories are things that we have really emphasized in this course so far. So the first one, fossil evidence for sponges being the first animals, they are the earliest animals that scientists have found to appear in the fossil record. So they have been found to be over 700 million years ago in the fossil record, okay? For morphological evidence, that is basically a fancy way of saying that when scientists look at phylogenetic trees, okay, and we've talked a lot about those so far in this course, when scientists look at phylogenetic trees, they're able to show that sponges share traits with, you know, outlier groups. And they're able to demonstrate that at the same time, sponges have specialized cell types that distinguish themselves from those non-animal outliers. Specialized cells that are associated with being animals, such as epithelial-based cells, okay? And the last one, of course, is my personal favorite, molecular evidence, because you know I love anything genetic. And molecular evidence is all about the genes, okay? The fact that despite looking so morphologically simple, okay, apologies to SpongeBob for calling them simple, but when you look at a sponge, you think, well, that's kind of simple. It doesn't look as fancy as, you know, when you think of the intricacies of a human, for instance. But despite that morphological simplicity, sponges demonstrate when you do genetic analyses of their sequences, their gene sequences, they demonstrate that they have all the basic genes necessary for the processes required by animals. So the processes that we think of being at, you know, attributed to just specifically animals, sponges have the whole genetic toolkit, okay? They have all the genes necessary to do those processes, okay? So again, this is the main hypothesis of which are the first animals, and we're looking at sponges to be that first animal. Now, when we talk about animals, it's important to think about their development, especially how their early embryonic tissues and muscles end up developing. And there's some terminology that I want you to know on this slide. First of all, animals can be either diploblasts or triploblasts. And the difference between them, I put in parentheses so you have the answer written on the slide. The difference between them is that diploblasts have embryos with two types of tissues, whereas triploblasts will have three. So you can see that in the figure down here at the bottom of the page, okay? Diploblasts have two germ layers. So germ layers simply mean embryonic tissue layers. And the two germ layers that diploblasts have are the ectoderm and the endoderm. Okay, so you see all the cells making those up. In between, they have mesoglia, which is not an embryonic tissue layer. That's simply this gelatinous, non-cellular material that separates the two cellular embryonic layers. Okay, so diploblasts have two embryonic layers. It's the ectoderm and the endoderm. Triploplasts sorry, triploblasts have both of those layers, the ectoderm and the endoderm, but they have an additional cellular germ layer called the mesoderm, okay? And so I want you to look here. Here I mapped out for you those three layers in the triploblasts and what they end up giving rise to. So ecto is on the outside, okay? Ecto on the outside, ends up giving the, the organism skin and nervous cell development. Endo, whenever you hear endo, that's on the inside. So endo, the endoderm layer, ends up developing into the digestive tract lining and any connected organs such as, you know, the liver, for instance. The last one, that middle layer, the mesoderm in triploblastic organisms, that ends up you know, developing into that meaty internal layers of circulatory system, your muscle development, and 
all of the internal structures such as bones and the various organs. Now diploblasts, you notice, do not have the mesoderm layer. That's because diploblasts are organisms like jellyfish and hydra, and they don't have those kind of structures, those same structures that the, tr the more developed triploblasts would end up having. Okay, so please make sure you're comfortable with the terminology on this slide and knowing what each of the layers end up giving rise to. And an easy way to remember is if you remember that ecto is on the outside, that helps you visualize the skin and the very important nervous system, which you can picture as, you know, kind of the connection it has to your skin. Think of when, you know, you, for instance, you burn your finger and you jolt back. If you visualize like that, it'll help you to remember these things easier, okay? And endo, you can underline the D of endo, and that will help you remember digestive, okay? So endo, digestive, and then meso, you can underline the M and think muscles, okay? Meso, muscles, and everything else that's inside because meso is also a middle term. Meso usually means middle in a lot of linguistics, okay? Now, when we talk about animals, animals have body symmetry, meaning that there are different forms of symmetry depending on the organism you're looking at. And that body symmetry will tell you what planes of symmetry they have, meaning, for instance, radial symmetry. This is seen in things like starfish and uh, a lot of sea organisms. But radial symmetry, what it means is you have two or more body planes of symmetry. Okay, so make sure you write down radial symmetry means that the organisms has the organism has two or more planes of symmetry. Meaning, for instance, if you look at this organism here, if you were to cut it along this line, these two halves would mirror. But if you then cut it along this, this line, these two halves would mirror. And if you cut along this line, these two halves, okay? So each of those lines represents a plane of symmetry, a line in which you, if you were to cut that organism in half, at that line, the two halves would have symmetry. They would mirror each other. This radial symmetry of having two or more planes of symmetry differs from bilateral symmetry, which you see in these two figures, because bilateral symmetry, the organism only has one, repeat, one plane of symmetry. Okay? There is only one line for the organism in bilateral symmetry where you can cut that organism in half and the two halves will be symmetrical, okay? They will mirror each other. Okay, which one do we have? Well, you can see in this figure that humans have bilateral symmetry, okay? So we have bilateral symmetry. We have this plane of axis right down our center where the two halves are symmetrical. So we only have one plane of symmetry as opposed to radial symmetry that has multiple planes of symmetry. And that's plane, P-L-A-N-E-S. Now, which of these two arose first? We have found through evolution that radial symmetry came first. Okay, and that makes sense because if you think of bilateral symmetry as being, you know, organisms like us, whereas you look at this creature here, and that's radial symmetry, it makes sense you know a lot of the organisms, the old, old, old organisms are things like sponges that might have uh, radial symmetry. Now, as we mentioned earlier when we first introduced the animals, animals have neurons or nervous systems, ex except for sponges. Now, when we talk about neurons and nervous systems, as I mentioned when we first introduced that idea of animals having these structures, these are important structures for transmitting electrical signals between cells, okay? So their main purpose is to transmit and process information in the form of electrical signals between cells.
Now there are various ways they can do this. Some organisms like the one that you see here, such as cnidarians or various other marine organisms, they have what's called a nerve net. Okay, A nerve net is basically a diffuse arrangement of nerve cells. Okay, so as you can see, this is diffuse, meaning it's all spread out. And that's D I F F U S E, diffuse arrangement of nerve cells. Now, some organisms with a nerve net will also have some ganglia, which we have in our central nervous system as well. And ganglia simply means a cluster of nerves. Now, speaking of the central nervous system, that's the form that we have, and I want you to put in parentheses CNS, like you see here, because sometimes on an exam, I'll refer to the central nervous system in its abbreviated form, which is CNS. And CNS is when your nervous system is arranged with having a brain and a spinal cord. So your central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, whereas the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, that is all of the other neurons spread throughout your body, okay? Now, when we look at these structures, notice that an organism with a CNS tends to have what's called cephalization. And cephalization simply means that that organism developed a head structure with a brain. Okay, so cephalization is when an organism develops a head structure with a brain. Now, what you'll notice is in the figures that we see here, a nerve net organism versus a central nervous system, you can see that body symmetry is related to the type of nervous system found in that organism. So I want you to circle star highlight the fact that radially symmetrical organisms, like you see in this picture here, so organisms such as hydra, for instance, or a lot of these marine organisms that you see with structures like this, radially symmetric organisms tend to have a nerve net, whereas bilateral symmetry or bilaterally symmetrical organisms such as humans, they tend to have a central nervous system. So please circle star highlight the association that if it's radially symmetric, it probably has a nerve net, whereas if it's bilaterally symmetric, it will have a central nervous system. Now some animals also have a structure that's called the column. And the column, what that is, you can kind of see it in this visual here uh, in, in organisms such as earthworms. The column is a fluid-filled cavity, okay? A fluid-filled cavity between that organism's inner and outer tubes, okay? So you see the outer tube of skin here from the ectoderm, the inner tube of gut, and in between, you have the column, which again is the fluid-filled cavity between the, the tubes of that organism. Now, its purpose is that it provides a space for the exchange of nutrients or things like oxygen, okay? So it's important for the circulation or exchange of oxygen and nutrients in that organisms. It also helps the internal organs to move independently of each other and independently of those tubes, the, the inner and outer tubes of that organism. Okay, but the main purpose is providing a space for the circulation of oxygen and nutrients. Now, when we talk about organisms in relation to the column, there's three categories that I want you to know, or three terms that I want you to know. Colomates, acolomates, and pseudocolomates, okay? And the difference between them is colomates, as you can see in this figure here, colomates such as earthworms, for instance, they have a column. 
So that's the figure that I was showing you here to demonstrate what the column is. That's because this is a columnate. It has the column, it has a, as this figure says, an enclosed body cavity completely lined with mesoderm. Acolamates, on the other hand, when you put the letter A in front of a term, it means without. So an acolamate is without column. So acolamates will not have a column. They do not have that cavity, that body cavity that's enclosed. The example I want you to know for this is flatworms. Okay, so flatworms are acolamates. The last term is pseudocolmates, and whenever you see pseudo, that kind of means fake. So, for instance, pseudopods in certain organisms, those are fake feet or fake limbs. So, pseudocolmates have a fake column because they have an enclosed cavity that looks similar to a column, but it's only partially lined with mesoderm and is not a a full true column. The example I want you to know for that is roundworms. Okay, so the examples for each colomates, the example I want you to know is earthworms, acolomates, please remember flatworms, and pseudocolomates, roundworms. Okay, and that's the difference amongst them is colomates have a column, Acolomates do not have that body cavity called a colum, and pseudocolomates have a partial, what we call fake, body cavity. Now when we talk about animals, and you're going to see this a lot later on in, the, in this lecture, we talk about two main categories. There are protosomes and deuterostomes, okay? And I want you to know the difference between them. Protostomes, what that means is first mouth. And that's named because in protostomes, during embryonic development, the mouth forms before the anus. And it comes from what's called the blastopore. So I want you to circle star highlight the structure called the blastopore and make note that in protostomes, the blastopore forms into the mouth. So it's a mouth first embryonic development. Whereas deuterostomes are the opposite. In deuterostomes, the blastopore instead forms the anus structure in embryonic development. So they are anus first. And there is a trick to remember these. If you Google deuterostomes meme, so M-E-M-E, -E, uh, you will see a cartoon that helps you remember that humans are deuterostomes, and it helps you remember that deuterostome means anus forms first from the blastopore. Uh, due to the language in the meme, I could not put it on the slide, but uh, I, I, I inform you of it just because it does help some people remember uh, the difference between protostomes and the fact that humans are an example of deuterostomes. So during our embryonic development, the blastopore becomes the anus rather than the mouth. And that means that we are second mouth. Deuterostome means second mouth because our mouth does not form first the way that protostomes do. Now, once those animals have developed beyond the embryonic stage and you look at the full-blown organism, a lot of animals have what's called segmentation. And the textbook definition of segmentation is basically the division of the body, or at least a part of the body, into a series of similar structures. Now, this division of the body into a series of similar structures can occur in various ways. In the vertebrate organisms, such as humans, okay, that segmentation is visible by our segmented backbone. Okay, so vertebrates are defined or characterized by having a segmented backbone. As you can see here, the four main segments of your backbone are the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and the sacrum uh, coccyx part of your backbone. Invertebrates also have segmentation and 
even though they do not have a backbone, that segmentation can be visualized, for instance, if you picture an earthworm and the various segments they have, or even if you picture arthropods, such as insects, and you picture their little bug bodies and the various segments that you see within that body. Okay. Now, when you think of vertebrates, I want the examples for you to remember to be things such as humans okay, and other chordata, things like fish, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals are all vertebrates. Okay, so please write down as examples of vertebrates, fish, reptiles, which includes birds, amphibians, and mammals, which includes humans. Whereas invertebrates, for invertebrates, I want you to write annelids and arthropods, okay? So annelids are things like earthworms and other segmented worms, whereas arthropods are insects, spiders, and crustaceans. Okay. Now, as we've been going through all of this terminology so far, you may have been noticing that animals are kind of diverse, okay? There's a whole lot of variety, a whole bunch of different types of animals, and you can see that even if you just look out your window, right? Your everyday encounters, you can visually see that there is big variety in terms of animals. Now, there are four main variables that seem to have contributed to this diversity of animals, meaning to the fact that there are so many variable different animals in the world. The first variable that contributed to how diverse animals are is the presence of higher oxygen levels, which happened around the start of the Cambrian era, which you may remember hearing that term Cambrian explosion and how there was suddenly a whole lot more oxygen around the world. Well, if you think about it, the more oxygen there is, the bigger, more complicated animals that can survive then, okay? So greater oxygen around the world and the atmosphere then leads to the evolution of bigger, more complicated or more complex animals being able to survive in that kind of an environment. There's also the evolution of predation, okay? So that basically means that as predators evolved, they basically exerted what we call a selective pressure on all of the other animals around them. So animals had to ultimately evolve or populations had to evolve to be able to survive against these evolving predators, okay? So think about how suddenly, you know, animals that had shells would be at a benefit. Animals that were quicker or that had certain structures that helped protect them, okay? So you can see the more predators that existed, the more you ended up with different structures that allowed for diverse animals to exist, okay? There's also the concept that new niches or new niches beget more new niches, okay? And what that basically means is, as you end up with more variety in animals, they end up creating new niches that could support even more ecological diversification, okay? And a niche, or you, you know, sometimes you hear it pronounced as a niche or niche. This simply means the role that an organism plays in an environment. So if you're having more variety in animals, you're going to end up with more roles, and then that will influence all the other animals around them. And that helps create more diversity as, you know, these new roles are developing in that ecosystem. Then, of course, there's my personal favorite, which is that modified genes leads to modified bodies, meaning that throughout time you get the evolution of various genetic sequences, right? We talked about genetics and all the mutations that can occur, the various different, um, you know, duplications and translocations and all these crazy terms of 
changes that can occur in gene sequences and the more changes that occur over time, the more variety you get in animals. So you end up with more diverse animals across the world because there's now more diverse genetics. Okay, so you have higher oxygen levels, changes in predators, changes in the roles or the niches that these animals lived in, and changes in genetics or the genes that all contributed to the fact that we have a very, very large biodiversity now. Lots of different animals look very different, all kinds of structures, and there's constantly new animals being found across the world as well. Now, as we talk about the diversification of animals, I wanna look at some of the diversity and some of the structures that they have. So this slide, I want you to know the diversification of sensory organs, basically the fact that look at all of these different sensory organs that eventually developed in animals. There is sight, hearing, taste and smell, and touch. And as you know, as animals, you use all of them. And basically, sensory organs are organs or structures that respond to different stimuli, okay? A particular stimulus will trigger that organ to allow you to sense something, whether it's your sight, hearing something, tasting and smelling something, or touch. Organisms also have diversification of the ecological roles, meaning the roles that they play in the ecosystems where they're living, how they interact with other animals or with their environment. And some terms that I want you to know, seen here on this side, detritivores, herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Now I'm sure all of you have heard these three terms, herbivores feeding on plants, carnivores eating meat, and omnivores such as most humans eating both. Okay, but keep in mind there are humans who are herbivores as well. So you have vegetarians and vegans which will not, you know, eating the, the full variety of everything. But the term that may be new to you is detritivores. So make sure you circle star, highlight that term. I want you to know the definition. These guys will feed on dead organic matter. So as you can see, this little organism here eating all of those decaying dead leaves that have fallen off of the tree or the plant. Okay, so please know these terms and what those organisms are eating. Now, in that previous slide, we introduced the idea of carnivores. Those are the animals that were eating meat, okay? Now, in those ecological roles, there are subheading type roles as well. So most carnivores are what we call predators. Predators means animals that hunt their prey. So they will hunt and kill other animals. The prey is the animal that's getting hunted or killed by the predator. Now, a lot of other organisms are also known to be parasites. And in microbiology, I teach parasites as undergrads. Um, but in actuality, parasites, what these are, are organisms that feed off of a host. Okay, so they cause some sort of harm to the host because they are feeding off of that host. Now, you may have heard the term parasite, but you may not have heard the two subcategories of parasites called endo versus ectoparasites. And these are prefixes that we've been mentioning in other cases throughout this lecture and throughout this course. What did I say about whenever you hear endo? Endo tells you within. So an endoparasite will be a parasite inside your body. So it's feeding off of the host from the inside of the body. Okay, an example of that that I want you to know would be the one in this visual. So something such as a tapeworm is an endoparasite. If, however, the parasite is hooked on or latched on to the outside of the host, Outside is ecto, so whatever you see, ecto or exo, 
that means outside. So parasites such as a tick or a flea, they're feeding off of the host from the outside. Even something such as a mosquito, okay? These kind of parasites will have some sort of a mouth part or a limb that allows them to suction onto the outside of the host and feed off of them, okay? So please know the difference between endo, you would find it inside the host, whereas ecto, the examples would be a tick or a flea. There's many other examples, but the two that you can know from this slide are a tick or a flea that would be on the outside, feeding off of the animal on the outside. Now, speaking of feeding off of something, animals have the develop various feeding strategies, meaning how they ingest their nutrients, ingest their food. So the four feeding strategies that I want you to know are suspension feeders, deposit feeders, fluid feeders, and mass feeders. Okay, so suspension feeders, they're basically going to sift nutrients and food particles, usually either found in the water or the air and they'll just filter them into their bodies, okay? Deposit feeders, on the other hand, they are feeding on organic material that has been deposited. So for instance, on the surface, as you can see, this little guy looks like a vacuum cleaning up organic material that has deposited itself on the surface of this, this floor, this sandy floor, okay? Fluid feeders, as the name suggests, they will be sucking up fluids, okay? So they're drinking in liquids as their main source of getting nutrients. And the last ones are mass feeders, such as ourselves. We are mass feeders because we take chunks of food and we rip and we tear out those chunks of food to then ingest. Now, one of the other aspects of animals that we mentioned all animals are capable of at one point or another in their lives is movement or motility. Now, when it comes to movement, there's a few different ways that various animals can use in order to have movement. The first one mentioned here is hydrostatic skeleton. Now, that you'll basically find in any of the soft, squishy, animals, kind of like uh, anemones or earthworms or even an octopus. And with the hydrostatic skeleton, basically what these organisms are doing is they're using a, a flexible body wall that has tension from surrounding, um, from their surrounding having, let's say, a, a fluid or soft tissue under a lot of pressure within their, their soft, squishy body. Okay, so a hydrostatic skeleton, picture a body wall that's very flexible, that's moving based on the tension of having fluid built up. Okay, fluid or soft tissue built up under compression. Now, you're probably more familiar with endoskeletons and exoskeletons. Now, we mentioned endo. Anytime you see endo, what do you have to think of? Inside, right? So within. Endo means a skeleton within, right? Endoskeleton, skeleton within. So that, for instance, would be in your body, right? So vertebrates having bones inside their bodies. Even sponges, sponge animals have what's called spicules, which is their version of, of bones within their body. You also have animals that have exoskeletons, and if you have ever accidentally stepped on a bug, a crunchy, crispy sounding arthropod, then you know that an exoskeleton, exo means outside. So these are organisms that have a rigid skeletal structure on the outside of their body. Kind of picture it as an external armor, okay, a body shield. So again, there can be hydrostatic skeletons, which you'll find in organisms such as earthworms, okay? There can be 
endo within skeletons like you find in your own body. And then there can be exoskeleton structures that are hard and rigid on the outside of a body, such as you find with arthropods or that uh, beautiful little silhouette of a snail here. Now, as the theme of today really shows, is that there is a ton of diversity, a ton of variation within all of the different animals. And this includes var variation or variety within their reproductive strategies, okay, their forms of reproduction. So some of the terminology I want you to know is that within animals, animals can be asexual or sexual. Asexual means that a single individual animal or organism will reproduce by splitting or having an offspring that is identical to themselves. Okay. Sexual, on the other hand, is reproduction in which two separate organisms meet together and you have fertilization. And that's important because sexual reproduction is a reproductive strategy that has allowed for a lot of biodiversity and, you know, the mixing of genes and new uh, interesting kind of organisms. And, and sexual reproduction is why humans are so varied, why, you know, humans don't all look the same or act the same. There's a whole lot of variation because sexual reproduction allows you to mix two different sets of uh, genes together. Now, within these reproductive strategies, there's other terminology. So parthenogenesis, crazy term you see here, that's an example of asexual reproduction. And it's an interesting example because rather than just, you know, picturing an animal splitting and, and having their identical clone, parthenogenesis is a form of asexual reproduction where an unfertilized egg actually develops into a full-blown, you know, embryo and, and organism. But again, since it's asexual reproduction, it is just one set of genes, one organism. There's not variety there. But it's different from the general term of asexual reproduction because parthenogenesis is specific to an unfertilized egg leading to a new offspring organism. Then within sexual reproduction, there are two main forms of sexual reproduction. There is sexual reproduction in which fertilization is external, which you see in this figure here. So external fertilization is what it sounds like. It means that the fertilization, the sperm meeting the egg occurs outside of the animal's body, which means that one animal will release its eggs into the environment unfertilized, a second animal will release its sperm into the environment on, you know, not having fertilized the eggs yet. And then out in the environment, for instance, in the water in this picture, the sperm will find the eggs and fertilize the eggs outside of any body of an organism. Internal fertilization, on the other hand, is exactly what it sounds like. It's the kind of fertilization that you have in humans. That's when one organism will have their sperm enter or transferred into the body of the second organism. And fertilization, the sperm fusing with the egg, occurs within the second organism's body. Now, within this type of fertilization, there are another two terms to know. So viviparous and oviparous, we're still talking about sexual reproduction, and we are talking about internal fertilization, but then what happens next can either be that the embryo develops and stays inside of the body, and then the mother gives birth to live young, and that is called viviparous reproduction. Whereas oviparous is if after the eggs have been fertilized, that mother organism then releases those eggs, those fertilized eggs into the environment. They, they deposit them outside of their body and those eggs develop 
outside of the body. Now notice this is different from when we talked about external fertilization because in oviparous organisms, fertilization occurred inside the body. That animal then released the fertilized eggs, not un unfertilized, they released an oviparous fertilize the eggs that then develop outside of the body and hatch into the new little offspring. So for instance, like you would see with a chicken. Okay, time for you to pause everything, grab your phone, and please send me your answer in the Remind app. I have formatted this one similar to how you will encounter questions on the exam to help you practice as you go through lessons and slides. Uh, practice, you know, thinking about what kind of questions can be made. How do you turn these lessons into multiple choice? It's a very good skill for you to have in any of the classes that you take. That was a whole lot of information, a whole lot of terminology. So I made one of my famous recap slides for you to pause and jot down uh, brief definitions of each of those terms we just defined. Now that was the main introduction of general animals. Now I wanna focus in on the two categories that we mentioned in the title slide, protosomes and deuterosomes. So the first category of proto protosomes, and remember, what does that mean? That means first mouth. These are the organisms whose blastopore during embryonic development becomes the mouth rather than the anus, okay? So the mouth, forms before the anus during embryonic development. Now, how are these protosomes distinguished from their deuterosome partners? That's the three points that I listed below on this slide. The first one is what we just mentioned, that embryonic development, the fact that their, proto, their blastopore becomes the mouth and that develops first rather than the anus. That's the main way to distinguish a protosome from a deuterosome. The second way that they're distinguished is that their early embryonic cells cannot develop into a complete embryo, whereas deuterosomes, such as ourselves, the early embryonic cells can be developed into a complete embryo. The last point is that Protosomes, their formation of the column occurs by the splitting of blocks of their mesodermal cells. So the mesodermal cells, remember that means the middle cells, the, the middle layer of the germ layers, those end up splitting to form the column. And again, the column is that gap between the internal and the outer tubes of development, okay? But the main thing I want you to focus on is this point here, the first point in terms of distinguishing protosomes. Now, when we talk about protosomes, there's two main categories of protosomes. There's the lophotrochozoans, and then later on, we're going to discuss the ectisozoans. Okay, I know, crazy word. You don't have to know how to write it now because we're going to spell it out later. But the first category of protosomes to talk about are the lophotrochozoans, and they're basically named after two traits. If you look at this term here, they're named off the, the fact that they have two traits. One is a lophophore, and the second is the trochophore, okay? Now, lophotrophozoans, these include organisms such as, if you've ever heard of rotifers, flatworms, annelids, so annelids are things like earthworms, and also mollusks are all examples of tro um, lophotrochozoans. And we're going to go through the examples of flatworms, annelids, and mollusks in the next few slides, so you'll have the spelling of all of those terms. Please know that those are the main examples. So if I say, you know, which of the following is an example of a lophotrochozoan, and I have flatworms, annelids, mollusks, and then name something such as, you know, um, arthropods, you should be able to, to know which ones are lophotrochozoans. Now, 
what exactly do we mean by lofotrochozoan? I just love saying that word because it's crazy. And the first part of that word comes from the fact that they have a lophophore, okay? And that is a feeding structure, okay? So the lophophore, you can see over, sorry, I gotta get the highlight out. The lophophore is a feeding structure, which you can see is basically a ring of ciliated tentacles. And ciliated means it has all those little hairs. Remember, cilia are little hair-like extensions. So lophophore is this ring of ciliated tentacles to help that organism pull in food particles. They also are named after the fact that they have trochophores. And trochophore is simply a fancy term to describe this here, which is a larvae that has a ring of cilia around its middle portion. And again, cilia are those little hair-like extensions. And cilia on this larvae are very important because they're used for two functions. They can shake or wiggle them around to help propel them forward or move them. Or they can use them kind of like we saw in the lophophore to help pull in particles. So for feeding, they can sweep food particles into their mouth. So lophophore is the feeding structure, that ring of ciliated tentacles for feeding. And trophil, trochophore is the larvae that has the, the central cilia ring for movement and for pulling particles into their mouth. Now this slide here is, like I mentioned in the previous slide, I want you to know examples of lophotrochozoa. Uh, again, remembering that all of these examples, since they're lophotrochozoa, that means they're also examples of protosomes. Okay, so please remember what term we're looking at, what an organism is. And so the examples of lophotrochozoa or protosomes are rotifers, flatworms, annelids, which includes earthworms. So whenever you see an earthworm, remember that little dude is a lophotrochozoa, and mollusks, okay? Now we're gonna go through each of the organisms that we just mentioned, some of the main groups here that are lophotrochozoa, and I'm going to keep saying that word because I love saying it. Go on, you know you wanna try saying it too. It's a fun word, impress all of your friends. So the first example I wanna go over are flatworms, and they're named because, well, look at them. It is a worm and it is flat. Sometimes scientists aren't as clever as you would think. So. Flatworms, one of the key features is that their body will be flat and broad shaped. And importantly, they lack a colon. Remember we talked about what organisms might have a colon earlier on. These guys lack a colon, so they would have, remember the A in front of the term, so they're an acolomate. Um, again, for spelling, you can go back to the previous slides because that's a term we already discussed. So flatworms lack a colon and they lack structures. They lack structures uh, that are specialized for gas exchange and circulation, which is a fancy way of saying flatworms lack a standard circulatory system or respiratory system. Okay, so the key features that I want you to make note of, they have a broad, flat shape. They lack a colum, so that's C-O-E-L-O-M, and they lack respiratory and circulatory systems. The next type of lophotrochozoan that I want you to know are annelids. Now these differ from flatworms. First of all, you can tell in their structure, their, the way they look, right? Instead of being flat, broad bodies, they are rounded. They, they are thick um, structures. Now these, most of them will have a colon. They will also have a fully developed digestive tract and a segmented body. So I want you to make note 
that annelids have segmented bodies. Okay, and you can see that in all of the pictures on this slide. You can see their segments. Now, I want you to know the three main categories are called polychaetes, oligochaetes, and hirudinea. That one always trips up me up. It's a little difficult to say hirudinea. And hirudinea is a fancy word for leeches. So these guys here. So the main examples are polychaetes, which are bristled organisms. They're diverse uh, category of, of worms. A lot of times you'll find them in marine environments, but notice they have those bristles along the outside. Oligochaetes are basically, if you think of having no bristles or very few bristles, and the main example are earthworms for oligochaetes. And then hirudinae, that means leeches. Okay, so any of these are categories of annelids. And I want you to know, you know, um, if you see the word hirudinae, what is that? That's a leech. Now to answer where you might find each of them, I wrote out the examples for you so you have the spelling and so you know the main you know, terminology of these examples. And if you think about what I just described or what I showed you, it can kind of give you a hint of where to find them. So polychaetes, those very bristly little creatures that I showed you in the previous slide, you usually find in marine environments. So um, deep within in the water, if you scoop out some of that mud and junk, you tend to find polychaetes. Legochaetes include earthworms. And if you think of earthworms, where will you find that? In the soil. So oligochaetes tend to be in the soil and hirudinea are leeches and a lot of times leeches are found in water. So be careful where you go swimming. Now the last category of lophotrochozoans that I want to mention are mollusks and mollusks, mollusks sorry, are defined by three main features and you can see these features, the spelling highlighted in this figure here. The main features are the foot, the mantle, and the visceral mass. Okay, so please circle star highlight that the key features of a mollusk include the foot, the mantle, and the visceral mass. You find all of those on a mollusk. The foot is basically how, just like with you, how you get around, how that mollusk moves around. So if you've ever seen out of a clam, this big, what looks like a tongue, is actually a foot that they stick out of their shell and they use it to pull themselves forward, to move themselves. The visceral mass, mass meaning a lot of things within, the visceral mass is all the meaty part of that organism. So all of the internal organs and even the external gills, the main chunk of that organism is the visceral mass. Then the mantle is an outgrowth of the body wall that covers that visceral mass. Okay, so it, it protects the meaty inside of that organism. So you can think of it as the shell, for instance. And it basically secretes in many of these species very hard calcium carbonate to then form what you call a shell. So the foot is what that, that little tongue looking extension that they whip out to pull themselves forward for movement. The mantle is their hard outer shell to kind of protect themselves. It, it you know, it's what builds a shell around them. So you'll see in this figure, it's listed as two different things because the mantle is the outer structure that secretes the carbonate, calcium carbonate that makes the shell, but you can just think of the mantle as the outer protection of the, the, the body to protect the visceral mass, which is all the gooey insides, the organs, okay? And examples of mollusks, as you can see in the figures here, include organisms or animals that you know, have nice solid shells around them, like clams, like snails, okay? Even a squid and octopus are also 
um, considered to be included within the, the category of mollusks. Okay, so not all mollusks will have as hard of a shell as you would picture, but they would still have a mantle, you know, covering their visceral mass. Okay, so make sure you know foot, mantle, visceral mass, those are terms associated with mollusks, and the mollusks include things like clams, uh, snails, squid, and octopus. So now that you're experts on lophotrochozoans, last time I get to say that for now, the other form of protosomes is known as ectisozoans, okay? And with the ectisozoans, I want you to circle star highlight the fact that these organisms molt, and that's M-O-L-T. What that means is the lophotrochozoans trochozoans that we've been talking about, including, um, you know, all of the organisms that we just went through, they're similar to humans in the fact that they all increase their size throughout their lifetime. So they'll have, you know, those incremental growth periods as organisms that continually grow just the way that we would. Ectisozoans are different in that rather than continually growing the way that we would, they grow intermittently with molting sessions, meaning that they have to every once in a while shed their, shed meaning get rid of their exoskeleton or whatever external covering that they have to then go through another growth stage, okay? So humans throughout, let's say puberty, you can keep growing and growing, your skin will grow with you. With ectisozoans, they have to shed their outer skin. They have to molt, write down M-O-L-T. Okay, see how in, e in e each of these you're seeing the term molted, molt? Okay, must be molted. Circle star, highlight that term because that's what makes them ectisozoans, okay? Now, you can see the examples listed out here. We have roundworms, we have the tardigrades that are adorable. If you take water samples, even from uh, like some of the, the ponds and lakes around here, sometimes you're able to catch a glimpse of water bears, the tardigrades. Uh, velvet worms and also arthropods are examples of ectozoans. And, you know, we mentioned the arthropods earlier with those crunchy exoskeletons. And so as you, you, you know, they have to molt or get rid of that because they're ex ectozoans. Okay, so the, the arthropods are one of the groups that we're going to spend a bit of time talking about since you are usually very familiar with those that includes things like insects spiders crustaceans that's going to be a major group that we talk about and that's why ectozoans comprise you know one of the major groups within the animal kingdom and is considered the largest because it includes the massive group of arthropods and also nematodes is another big group Now, when we talk about arthropods, I want to point out that there's some terminology I want you to be familiar with when you look at arthropods. The two terms I want you to know the difference of, both are examples of metamorphosis. You know, metamorphosis being a transition, a, a life cycle transition that an organism can go through. The two examples I want you to know or be able to distinguish between are incomplete metamorphosis and complete metamorphosis. And sometimes you'll see incomplete written as hemi-metabolis, so hemi being half versus complete being hollow because hemi is half, hollow is whole. Now, the difference I want you to notice between these is that incomplete metamorphosis will have a stage called nymphs. So circle star highlight the term nymph and make note that in this picture, in this picture you can see nymphs are a life cycle stage or a metamorphosis stage that basically looks like a smaller version of the adult. 
Okay, so in incomplete metamorphosis or hemimetabolis, the, you will see nymphs that look like smaller versions of the adult. Make sure to write that down. Whereas complete metamorphosis or hollow metamorphosis, which you see here, instead of having a nymph stage, hollow or complete metamorphosis will have a larval stage. And that's a distinct, unique stage. And you notice that the larva looks completely different from the adult. Okay, so you can see that here in the real versions of the pictures. This larva does not look like a ladybug, but it is actually part of the metamorphic stage of the ladybug life cycle. Okay, so if I tell you that in a life cycle, an organism has a larval stage, then you know that it's complete metamorphosis. Whereas if I ask you about a life cycle that has a nymph stage, that will be an example of incomplete metamorphosis. Now, all of those were the protostome animals. Now we're going to move on to the deuterostome animals, which is important because this group not only includes the largest bodied animals and some of the most morphologically complex of all animals, it includes us, okay? And a reminder, what deuterostome actually means, that's second mouth, meaning that any of these animals, their blastopore becomes the anus in embryonic development, as opposed to becoming the mouth that the protostomes would have. Now, the four phyla that I want you to associate with deuterostomes are written out right here. Okay, so these are the four phylum that are examples of deuterostomes, and here you can see all of the phyla associated with protostomes. And notice we talked about annelids, mollusks, arthropods, all, all the important groups of protostomes. Now, I want you to circle, star, highlight, chordata, because we're going to talk about that in a minute. That includes us. Okay, so that's an important phyla in the deuterostome world. The first of the deuterostome phyla that I want to talk about are the echinoderms. The echinoderms, that literally translates into spiny skins. And as you can see from these little creatures here, they are spiny skinned. Okay. Now, one of the important points that I want to make with this group or this phyla is that where do you find them? Only in marine environments, okay? So they are exclusively marine, M-A-R-I-N-E, meaning you find them in water environments. Now they have some key features which you see some of them drawn out here. The first one I want you to write down is that echinoderms are radially symmetric. Okay, so make note, the first key feature I want you to uh, be aware of is that they are radially symmetric, which we went over earlier. You'll notice you're not going to see like a head structure. Uh, another characteristic is that they have endoskeletons. So that's a hard structure located within, you know, b below their skin to protect and support their body. The other key features that they have are drawn over here. So they have a water vascular system and they have tube feet. Okay, so if I mention water vascular system and tube feet, we are talking about echinoderms. The water vascular system, that's basically just a series of tubes throughout the body that forms a version of the hydrostatic skeletons that we mentioned earlier. So you notice it looks kind of like uh, a little skeletal system in here, uh, but it's not the kind of skeleton that we would have. And then tube feet, which you see here, all of these little extensions coming out of this structure here, okay, that helps with movement, you know, like any foot would. So they use those to help grab a hold of surfaces and pull themselves, you know, along that surface. Okay, so please be aware these are marine organisms. 
In their adult form, they will be all radially symmetric. They will only show bilateral symmetry if they're in a larval stage, but I want you to really focus on radially symmetric. They have a water vascular system and tube feet. Now, many of the deuterostomes okay, are what we call keystone species. So when you see a keystone species, it's usually a deuterostome. Now, kind of like the name su suggests, a keystone species is pretty important. It's a key element in an ecosystem. What keystone species actually means is that these are animals, such as the ones that you see on the picture here, that are not very abundant in actual numbers, and yet they have a massive impact on the environment or the ecosystem that they're living in. Okay, so we say that they have a greater impact on, you know, for instance, the, the abundance of surrounding species compared to the fact that they're actually in low abundance themselves. And as you can see, for instance, some of the ones on the screen, pretty big, scary predators, for instance. So they have a very big impact on how many animals can be around them, even though there aren't that many of themselves. So there is, it's pretty interesting when you study keystone species. Now, like I mentioned a few slides ago, in addition to the echinoderms, deuterostomes also have the phylochordates or chordata. Chordates is significant because the significant example of a chordate is humans. So we are chordates, okay? Now, if you are a chordate, you will share four morphological features with all of your other little chordate friends. Now, these features do not necessarily get seen in your final adult form, okay? They just have to be present at some stage in your life cycle. The four features are pharyngeal slits or pouches, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a notochord, and a muscular post-anal tail. Now I know what you're thinking, you're like, wait, you said humans are chordates. I don't have pharyngeal slits that are like gills. I don't have a tail. What are you talking about, woman? Where did you get your biology degree? Well, if you look at this cute little picture of what we looked like growing inside the womb, you will notice. Letter A here, these are pharyngeal pouches, okay, kind of like baby gills, right? Pharyngeal pouches are letter A. B is your dorsal, so dorsal being on your backside, right? There, it's your dorsal hollow nerve cord, which runs the full length of your little body, okay, and is composed of projections from neurons. You then have C. C, this red structure here, that is your notochord, okay? It's a stiff and supportive cord which runs the full length of the body. And then D, what do you notice? What's that little thing there? That's your little tail, okay? So that's your, your muscular, they call it muscular post-anal because it's beyond your anus, your tail, okay? So again, A is the pharyngeal pouches, B is your nerve cord, C is your notochord, and D is the tail. Okay, if you have those four morphological features present at some stage, including in your embryonic stage, and then we don't have it, you know, those in the adult life, you don't have your tail, but it still counts because you had it at some stage of your life. So that makes you a chordate. Now, one of the major examples or groups within chordates are vertebrates. So if you think about humans, humans are vertebrates. 
that are an example of chordates that are thus an example of deuterostomes, okay? So, you know, don't get confused like, wow, but you said humans are an example of chordates or you said humans are an example of this. It's all connected. So the big umbrella term, the biggest of the terms is deuterostomes, then chordates are an example of deuterostomes, and then vertebrates are an example of chordates. Now, vertebrates, what that means is you have two main structures that other animals may not have. You have a vertebrae and you have a cranium. Okay, so the vertebrae, that's basically that column of cartilage and bone structures which you have running along the dorsal side of the body. And again, dorsal is that back side. Okay, and then a cranium is a bony or fibrous case that's surrounding the brain. Okay, so for instance, the skull consists of the cranium. Okay, now when you think of vertebrae, okay, we mentioned terms bone and cartilage. Now, the difference between them, you probably know this already, bone is solid, okay? It's dense tissue, hard tissue, okay? It has cells and blood vessels and a matrix that's mainly calcium phosphate, but I'm not gonna ask you the details of its composition, okay? The main thing I want you to know is that bones are dense and, and solid, whereas cartilage is strong, but it's flexible, okay? So it's a softer, more gel-like matrix rather than being rock solid the way bones are. Now, what's interesting is that in, in many species that have bones, bones actually start out as cartilage. They're cartilaginous first and then become bones later in development, okay? So make sure you're, you're comfortable with you know, what makes a vertebrate a vertebrate? What are those two things it's got to have? And then what's the difference between bone and cartilage? Now, when we talk about vertebrates, I want to point out the brain, okay? So hopefully you're using this structure right now as you're going through these slides. The brain from the beginning of vertebrates was made up of three main regions. They are highlighted in this lovely figure. The three regions were the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain, okay? And each played its role in these early vertebrates, just like they play a role in, in us now. The forebrain, okay? So the forebrain right here, this was responsible for the sense of smell when we're looking at sensory functions. The midbrain was then responsible for vision and the hindbrain was responsible for balance and in some species hearing, okay? Now that's, you know, we're looking at early vertebrates. Now, if you think about us today, We've evolved within these, you know, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the high brain, uh, hindbrain. We have further structures that are breaking them down. As you can see here, you have important structures such as the cerebrum. You have in the hindbrain, the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. Okay, these are all structures you go into a lot of detail in 150 and 160 because they're very critical in terms of all of your abilities, your, your various thought processes, your various reflexes and whatnot. You know, you have a lot of things going on when it comes to your brain. We're not gonna go into all of the, um, the details of that. I just want you to be aware that in early vertebrates, we focused on hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. Their association with sensory functions, the forebrain being smell, the midbrain being vision, and the hindbrain being balance and hearing. And then just be aware that we have these further evolution of structures, but we're not gonna go into the details of what each of them do in this particular course. Now, speaking of evolving structures and really what makes vertebrates vertebrates, 
there were some really important developments that happened in vertebrates. And the first one that you see listed here is the origin of the jaw critical for things like predation and you know being able to really tear and and chomp down on your food there's the origin of limbs which as you know very important for movement so the ability to really get further and and go faster there's the evolution of amniotic egg Okay, and the amniotic egg is different from other eggs. So for instance, amphibians, they just had a jelly coated eggs. Okay, and that was basically, you know, a way to try and prevent their eggs from, from drying out when they, when they laid them. It's not very protective. Whereas the development of an amniotic egg provided a protective covering. Okay, so that greatly reduce the rate of drying, which is important for uh, vertebrates, you know, that are that they're on land, you know, so you don't want the eggs drying out. So the amniotic egg, you can make a little note for yourself that basically is an egg that now developed to have an extra coating around it. Okay, extra protective layer. Uh, help reduce drying and further protect the developing offspring. Now, animals that have amniotic eggs are known as amniota or amniotes. And I want you to know what are the two types of animals that are amniotes. They are mammals and they are reptiles. Okay, so mammals and reptiles. And each of these groups developed some very important things specific to their types of animals. Mammals, I want you to know they developed or, or evolved fur and lactation. So they did that development of lactation by having unique structures called mammary glands. Okay, they could produce milk for their offspring. And reptiles, they evolved to develop scales and feathers. Okay, so make sure for reptiles, you write down, they evolved scales and feathers. And it's funny because when students think of reptiles, they think of scales, yes, but they usually don't think of feathers because they forget that birds are a form of reptiles. They, they evolved from a common reptile ancestor. And that's why if you look at the face of some, some birds, especially things like turkey vultures and, and, and even turkeys themselves, you can kind of see that, you know, scary dinosaur-like, um, lizard-like features to their face, okay? So when we say reptiles developing scales and feathers, you know, don't, don't ignore the feathers. A lot of students just focus on the scales, okay? So make sure you remember mammals and reptiles are the two amniotes that you need to know. And make sure you know mammals evolved fur and lactation. Reptiles evolved scales and feathers. That is it for today. As always, if you have any questions, please contact me in the Remind app. Okay, thank you and have a great day.